All right, good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. My name is Seth Cooley, and I am the children's pastor here at Canyon View Vineyard Church, and I just want to welcome you if you're visiting today for the first time, and for those of you watching online, um, we're encouraged to have you here today, and it's my pleasure to speak to you. I want to give you a little bit of history about who I am and help you catch up with where we're at. Um, I'm 37 years old. I've been in children's ministry for about 10 years. I was raised in Delta, Colorado, just south of here, graduated from Delta High School in 1994. Um, attended Mesa State College and graduated from there with my degree in a Bachelor of Science um, in Biology. That was in 2000. And um, then in 2002, I took a really bold step and stepped into a role as a children's pastor at um, Northeast Christian Church. I was there for three and a half years and then um, went through a very difficult time with that church. Um, started here in April of 2007, and I've been here for six years. It's been a, just a real privilege to be part of your kids' lives um, these past six years. I want to bring you up to date with where we're at. We're in this uh, vertical series, and this is week five of a 40-day study, um, just learning about managing the things that God has given us, learning to be good stewards uh, of our possessions and of our time and our energy and if you've been in a small group, if you've been doing the study on your own, um, I just want to encourage you, stay with it. We're almost finished. And um, just be asking, God, what are you trying to do through my life during this time? I, I just believe in good things for our church because of this series. And um, I, I hope that you'll listen today to the words that God's given me to bring. Let's start in Matthew, and uh, it's going to be chapter 6, verse 19. I'm going to read this passage, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Matthew 6, 19 through 21 reads, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Would you pray with me as we receive that word from God? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here and the freedom to um, worship you and to read your word. And I just pray that you'll open our hearts to the message that you have for us today. Um, I, I pray that you will use uh, my words and the words of the scriptures um, to just get to the heart of the issue. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. From that text, the, the last verse... Verse 21, it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And the, the main takeaway that I want to make sure that we get today is that my heart is where my treasure is. And the reason that we need to talk about finances in church is because finances are closely tied to heart. And heart is really what God is wanting to get about. And I hope that you'll see that today. Talking about money is a very difficult thing. I was studying it. The, the number one fear in America is public speaking. And then if you talk to all the pastors, their number one fear of sermons would be a sermon about giving. And uh, I'm the children's pastor, so my sermons on giving usually don't a lot to large amounts of dollars. But, you know, it's okay. They still have to get the principle. And that's a lot what I'm going to talk to you about is how it's not about the money. It really is about what God's trying to do. Um, my giving story, I feel like, is the best place to start because when you understand what's happened in my life, I hope that it speaks to your life. It started at home with my parents, and my dad was a beekeeper. Uh, he had lost his arm in an industrial accident in 1973, and so from the time I was born, I only ever knew him with a hook for a, a right arm. And um, he was self-employed, so he, he worked in the beekeeping trade, and we didn't have a lot of money growing up, but we had 120 acres, and my dad would say that we're money, uh, land rich, but cash poor. And um, from a very young age, he would begin to involve us in the business, and uh, one of my first jobs that I took from him was building the frames that go inside the beehive that the bees put the honey on. And he began paying me 50 cents an hour to build these frames and to just work for him. And he said, here's the deal, son. I'm going to pay you for the things that you do for me, but here's my restrictions on this. You can't just do anything you want with the money. You've got to take 10% of it 
and that's going right back to God because God is the one that gives us the energy to do the work, that God is the one that gives us this beautiful air we breathe. And in the honey business, if, if God doesn't make the flowers grow, there's no place for the bees to get the honey from. And he said, so we have to, we have to honor God with our first 10%. And then he said, I want you to take 40% and you're going to set that aside because you're going to want some bigger things. And I know being a young man, probably eight or nine years old at the time, he says, I know you're not going to want to save for these things, but you're going to want some things and I want you to set aside money for it. So then he said, the remaining 50%, you can spend however you want. If you want to buy trading cards, if you want to buy candy, if you want to um, buy video games, he, he left me that other 50%. And so from the beginning, I realized, you know what? This money belonged to my father. He's giving it to me. He could have just made me do the work. I was his son. He was feeding me. and He was putting a roof over my head. But he chose to give me money because he wanted to teach these principles. And, and I was able to save for some things. Um, one of the things that I bought with my 40% savings, at the age of 10, I bought my first 22 long rifle. It was a semi-automatic and thus became a a strong love of guns in my life, but you know, it's Colorado, so that's the way it is, right? <laughs> so um, I, I want to take you to a quote. This comes from John D. Rockefeller. He says, I never would have been able to tithe the first million dollars I ever made if I had not tithed on my first salary, which was a buck fifty a week. And it's so true. When I look back, one of the things that my dad did for me at that time, other than the most important part, was giving me some really good perspective was that he got me into the habit of giving regularly to God. So then as I got older and I started working jobs and making more money, it wasn't very difficult to stay faithful to God in my giving because I had started when I was very young. And so giving must be modeled at home. And, and, and with the backdrop of the baby dedication today, this is such a great um, reflection of saying why we do what we do as a church. Um, we want these things passed from generation to generation. It's like any other habit, starting with a small amount and then working up is always best, and you can see immediate results that way. It also has to come from the parents. The parents model that, and the kids believe it. And if my dad had made me do that with his money, but I didn't watch him do the same thing, then I would have wondered why he was asking me to do this. Um, in the previous weeks... Pastors Kirk and Bob have reminded us that everything that we have, material possessions and our energy, our health, all of it belongs to God. And we've talked a lot about trust and where our trust is and that our trust is not to be in the things of this world, but our trust is to be in the God who has redeemed us. And getting vertical, what it really is about is it's about perspective. What perspective do you have when it comes to the money that you've earned, the things, the possessions that you have, your home, your cars, what's the perspective that surrounds that? And, and that's where I'm hoping that we'll discover today. Sometimes Jesus' teachings in the Gospels is referred to as the upside-down kingdom. And part of that is this idea of the first shall be last and the last shall be first. We don't, we don't use worldly perspectives necessarily to understand heavenly things, and um, you're going to see that unravel as I explain through these scriptures. So I want to look at three things that are going to happen in your life as you begin to steward God's treasures that he's entrusted you. The first one is giving means that we share in God's work. We're sharing in God's work when we give. We become a part of it. From 3 John, verses 5 through 8, it says, Dear friend, you're being faithful to God when you care for the traveling teachers who pass through, even though they are strangers to you. For they have told the church here of your loving friendship. Please continue providing for such teachers in a manner that pleases God. For they are traveling for the Lord, and they accept nothing from people who are not believers. So we ourselves should support them so that we can be their partners as they teach the truth. We saw a video about a trip to Brazil, and as you sit here as part of our, con our congregation, you participated in that trip even if you weren't able to go. That um, We have children in a nursery, a uh, youth ministry going on right now. You're participating in the teaching and the raising up of these kids even as you sit here among us. Um, I, I think back to when I was a young child and even just giving maybe a dime off of my first dollar 
that that dime, who knows where it ended up, if it ended up in Africa with missionaries or if it ended up um, lighting a light bulb in the church, I don't know. But the neat thing is, is that God takes it and he uses it and we become partners with him in that. I have to use something really visual, and I told the 9 o'clock service, in children's ministry, we always serve a snack during service, so I brought my own up today, being the children's pastor here. But the, the, the visual of the apple is a story that I stole from somebody that came up with this, and most of the best ideas are stolen, actually. So you're welcome to use anything that you would like. Um, but I would take 10 apples and sit down with my two boys, they're 12 and 9, and I would spread out 10 apples out on the counter. And then I would pick up those one apple out of those 10 apples. And I said, boys, God has given you all of these apples, all 10 of these apples. We're to be faithful and return one of these apples to him. And then we're to look at the other 90%. We're supposed to use that wisely and steward that wisely. And they go, oh, I see how it is. Now, I could take money and lay dollars out. The interesting thing about looking at fruit from the ground and you talk to farmers or ranchers, they really get this concept, is that this apple wouldn't grow without God, without the right nutrients, the right environment, the right sunlight and water. Like God's a part of that. It also involved the hard work of a farmer, I have no doubt. And when they think about giving apples, that's pretty easy. If somebody else needs an apple, sure, you can have my apple, right? It's funny how it changes when we convert it to something other than dollars and cents. And so we would begin to look at that and say, okay, well, out of 10 apples, 90, that's quite a bit of apples. That, that's going to last me for a while. And um, I would just begin to show my boys and sometimes the, children's in the ch children in the children's ministry just talking about why we give and really getting to what, what's God looking for? Why does he ask us to give? If he has everything he needs, why does he want us to give? Another reason that I've looked at as, as giving in my life is this idea of investing. And uh, today we're talking about a worthy investment, a, a place to invest time and energy um, and money. But when we invest, a lot of times we, we look at risk versus reward. I'll never forget the first time Michelle and I started looking at how we, and my wife is Michelle, by the way. Uh, we've been married for 17 years. Forgot to put that in. But Michelle and I would sit down and talk about our money and say, okay, um, you know, financial advisors in the late 90s were telling us, you know, you really need to be putting money away in a 401k, uh, 403b, and, and have that growing because the stock market was growing by leaps and bounds. And it's like, we, you know, we've got to be part of that. But they'd say, you know, you're really young. You should look at risk versus reward. And if you take a lot of risk right now and get really aggressive with your stocks, then they can grow quite a bit more than if you're really conservative and put them in bonds or something that will grow, but it will grow very slowly. And um, this is the neat thing when I look at heavenly investments the heavenly investment, the investment that we make in our relationship with God, it has guaranteed returns. Not a single investor could tell me that absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt, what you put in, you're going to see it. And as we know from the 90s, fast forward 10 years, it's definitely not as sure as we thought it was. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. It says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. What I read there when I hear it is it's not an either-or you know, either you take a lot of risk for a lot of reward. It's, and it's not a vow of poverty. I'm going to take a vow of poverty on earth and then everything is for heaven. What, what God is saying is, he says, not only are you going to store up treasures for the next life, but it will change your life currently as you begin to change your perspective on the things that God brings into your life. And, and I think that it's, 
it's really important to share a, a major perspective change that I had in my early 20s. I, I started working a factory job over here at Coors Ceramics, and they had a great uh, 401k. We had uh, paid time off, and uh, just beginning to work some long hours while I was finishing up my college degree. And all of a sudden, I noticed that I started to get so much smarter than my father. And early 20s, I don't know what happened to him, but all of a sudden, I knew everything, and he knew very little, and I was pretty good about telling him about it. And I went to him one day, and I said, Dad, I said, how come you haven't been building a retirement? How come you don't have a 401k, and you should have five weeks vacation by now, but you chose to work as a beekeeper, and you know, you, you don't hardly even have medical insurance, and you definitely don't have a retirement and he said, son, I made that choice long ago when I chose to be a beekeeper. He said, I had five kids, four boys and one girl. I'm the middle child, by the way. And he said, I had you guys, and you guys are in my, my investment that I've chosen to pour into you. This job that I took, it allowed me to bring you along. And, and he did. He involved us as young boys in his beekeeping business. He used to share a story about me that would just get a rise out of people. He said, I started my son smoking when he was five years old. And people's jaws would drop to the ground like, what? And, and what he did was he had me run in the smoker. It's, it's really the safest place. If you ever go into a bee yard with a beekeeper, get a hold of that smoker because you can really fend the bees off. And uh, I would smoke the hive and the bees would run back into the hive and then he would pop the lid and do the work. And... and uh, and he needed that because it was really tough to run the bellows on a smoker with a hook. And so he, he brought me along. And um, all those times that we got to share about life and, and perspective and um, just what the meaning is, it was because of that choice. He chose that kind of a life. And there was many times that our family was very short on finances, but we had a lot of family time together and, and some real quality uh, investment. And it wasn't until 2001, which I declare a banner year for me, of course it was a year the, the Twin Towers fell, and I'll never forget it for that reason, but in February of 2001, end of January, my 12-year-old my son was born, um, and then in Veterans Day of 2001, my father passed away from cancer, and he was 56 years old. And I said, wow, so much for retirement. So much for all of the things that I thought were incredibly important and was so much smarter than him. My perspective was all wrong. And as I began to evaluate my life, I realized it wasn't just finances because Michelle and I had, had been married five years at this point. And we hadn't been going to church. We hadn't been faithful to God in our finances. And I said, you know what? Things are going to change. And I not only changed how I was with my money, but I changed my time, how I spent my time. And I realized, you know what? I even need to trust God with my career. And I had a dream of being a game warden for the Division of Wildlife. And uh, I'd worked a couple of summers for them. I actually passed two game wardens on the way to church today. They're very busy. It's hunting season. And I turned to Michelle and said, so that's how they spend a Sunday morning. And uh, God was saying, do you trust me? Do you trust me with the days you have left? Because through losing my father, I realized, you know what? I really don't know whether I'll live to see retirement. I don't know if I'll live to see next week. How am I using today? How am I using the energy that God's given me, the time, the finances, to grow God's kingdom? Because as soon as you have a loved one on the other side, all of a sudden it becomes a lot more real. And uh, it's that perspective that, I, that I've carried forth in 10 years of children's ministry and looking into the eyes of these kids and, and imagining what they'll be when they grow up and imagining my dad working with me as a young boy not knowing that he wouldn't live to see my 26th birthday, but that he was to invest in the time that he had while he had it.
the third point that I want to make today from our scriptures. Investing in eternity changes my heart presently. And this is where we really get to the issue of what God wants to do in this vertical series. It has to do with heart change. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. It says, remember this, the person who plants a little will have a small harvest. The person who plants a lot will have a big harvest. Each of you should give as you have decided in your heart to give. You should not be sad when you give. You should not give because you feel forced to give. For God loves the person who gives happily. You've probably heard it read, God loves a cheerful giver. And God can give you more blessings than you need. Then you will always have plenty of everything, enough to give to every good work. See, in this text, Paul identifies that it really is a heart issue. I can speak all the logic in the world to your mind, but only the Spirit of God can speak to the heart. And in my life, it took some pretty ground-shaking things happening to make that perspective shift, to start to realize that things aren't the way they seem presented on TV or in the newspaper, to realize that there was much, a much deeper reason for being on this earth. But then always comes the test, right? When you arrive at this perspective, uh, I, I began ministry at Northeast Christian Church in October of 2002. And by spring of 2006, our church had arrived at a pretty rough spot. And uh, I turned in my resignation in March of 2006 and went into what I would call a desert time in my life, a time where I had to step away from doing ministry and start looking at now what? Now what do I do? And how would I represent God to my kids? What would my life be like? In summer of 2006, I was just working part-time and spending time at home with the boys so we didn't have to pay daycare, and my wife was still working full-time. And um, we continued, as the money came in, to set God's 10% aside, even though we no longer had a body where we belonged to where we could give that. And we would just set it aside, trusting that God had a plan for it, and we always believed in keeping a savings for ourselves so that we could get through hard times. And we just watched that number drop lower and lower. It was in August of 2006 that uh, we were down to about $800. And we had a water heater go out. And I had the plumbing company come in, and it was $800 to put in a new water heater and fix it. And we really had that tough choice where we were looking at, we had this money set aside that we believed was God's and for his purposes. And then we had this money, the, the 90% that was left for us, and it ran out. And that was the point where I knew as a leader, I had to either believe in, in what I had spoken of for so many years or just do whatever I felt like. And when the money ran out, I'll tell you what it did was it forced me to, get, to look for a job that maybe I wasn't looking for before. And by September 1st of that year, God had provided a job. Um, not a wonderful job. It was farmer's insurance. It paid the bills. I was a claims adjuster working in the auto insurance business. Definitely a desert time in my life, but they had a company car and, and it had benefits. The, the point is, if I had turned to the money I was setting aside as God's and decided to just supply myself then I don't think I would have arrived at that decision to take that job and to step up. Um, a lot of changes happened because of that job, where, where in, within a year I was on staff here at Canyon View, and those desert times propelled me into the next season of ministry. And um, we had some people approach us during the time that wanted to uh, take the message of, of the gospel to Mesa State College, and... Even though we were in a difficult time, we knew that that was something we wanted to give to, that God was tugging at our hearts that we needed to give to that. And then when we were able to place our membership here at Canyon View, that we also were able to walk in and go, you know what? Not only do we believe in this church, but we're going to participate in this church in giving. And I was so thankful that we had stayed faithful to God through that, that desert moment. Mostly because what it told me about my heart and, and where God was trying to lead my heart. Because 
The rest of the apple story that I didn't tell you is after I laid out all those apples, somehow my boys have the spiritual gift of sarcasm. <laughs> They're a little smart Alex, that's for sure. And they said, Dad, this apple thing, it's a great idea, but you know what? God doesn't even need that apple. He's got apples. Why does he need that apple? And I said, you know what? You guys are right. You're getting the point. God wants what's tied to this apple because this apple is tied to my heart. When, when I feel like with my hard-earned work and time and effort that I've earned that, that my heart's closely tied to those things that I've gathered, those possessions, and the time that I've invested in hobbies and, and all of that, that my, my heart really is tied to it. And just like talking about exercise or diet, a lot of us know what we're supposed to do, but actually doing it, that's the hard part. That's the difficult part. And when you're able to look down and say, you know what, God is controlling my decisions in my time, my energy, my finances, then you know that you're on the path that he's wanting. And it really is where that action, that faith leads to action. And I, I recognize that in that moment. See, when I give my heart to God in the area of finances, I know that I share in advancing God's kingdom. I'm a partner in that. I know that I have treasure that can never be taken away. It's the deposit has been made and it's there waiting for me. And most importantly, I know that God has a hold of my heart and that I'm following him with everything that I have. You think back to Genesis and the very first sin and not too long after that, we have two boys and, and a murder is committed over what? A sacrifice. They were both sacrificing to God because God wanted to know if he had their heart or not. And, and Cain was upset with Abel because his sacrifice was not acceptable, whereas Abel's was. And uh, I spoke, that was the last sermon I gave on my birthday in 2006, um, was about Cain and Abel. And it's just interesting looking back. I found my notes as I was preparing for this sermon and realizing there's a lot tied, there's a lot of heart issue tied to the things that we've raised and, and grown with our own hands. I'd like to invite the worship team back up. And as they're coming up, I'd like to point you back to our main, our main point for today is that my heart is where my treasure is. Treasure and heart are tied closely together. And with that being said, if God is speaking at your heart today, if something that I have said has stirred um, something from the message, something from the scriptures has, has stirred you to action, I'd like to propose three possible action steps that can help you to get rolling today. The first one is that we need to talk it out with God. Since we understand this is about a heart and a heart issue, that we have the conversation with God first and foremost. God, I understand that you've given me everything that I have, that my job, my family, my possessions, my house, that it all came from you. And just talk to him about it. Thank him for it, but then just tell him how hard it is for you to turn things back. And I know it's hard because I've been doing that myself. But first, we need to talk, talk things out with God. The second step, after you've spoken with God, if you want to see something to go to action, then you want to verbally share that with someone that you trust. Someone that can help you carry that, who will check back in with you and say, how are you doing with that? I understand that you wanted to change. Is that change happening? So talking with others whom you trust about your plans to change. The third thing that I really want to encourage is we need to start small and rejoice in every victory. As you look at it and you say, you know what? As I received these 10 apples, I figured out exactly how to spend all 10 of them. In fact, I've been at a place in my life before where I was spending 11 apples of the 10 that I received. It happens. We get sucked in really easily. Just start small. Just start, start wherever you feel like God leads you and he speaks to you and he says, here, right here is where I want you to start. Right here is where I want you to do something. And then rejoice in that victory. Rejoice when you realize, I let go of something that I thought was really important to me. And God took it and he did amazing things with it. Things with it that I couldn't do. 
It's kind of like the snowball principle in debt. Uh, when Michelle and I started paying off debt, they said, you want to pay off the smallest debt first, even if it's not the highest interest debt, that you pay off that debt and then you take that money and you apply it towards paying off the next debt and you get a snowball rolling and it just gains steam as it goes. So I want you to apply that snowball principle in your life in the area of giving. As you start to give and you see what God does in your heart, then just let that encourage you to even more find out where is God trying to lead me in this whole area of giving. Would you stand with me as we worship?